Good afternoon, everyone. It is Saturday, uh, November 2nd, and um, welcome to OTJ TV. I haven't done this in a little while. Please forgive me if I'm very rusty. I uh, had an interesting technical experience uh, just this afternoon, uh, which we have obviously solved because it seems as if we're actually live. And at least the people are in the room. Um, if you want others to join, please tell them to come. I think we've got an especially good show today uh, with our guests who are here to talk about their book, uh, Barrier Free Education. And it's got this really long subtitle, which I don't remember, but somebody will. And they're the ones who are going to tell you about that book because I know everybody can buy it. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to introduce everyone. Uh, everyone, uh, this is uh, Dr. Melody Cook, Dr. Davey Young. And Alexandra Burke, uh, most of them, I'm sure uh, you've all seen. And if you haven't ever seen them before, welcome to this afternoon. We're going to get to know them fairly well. Um, first of all, uh, Alex, you're fairly upfront with everyone about how you try to be an advocate for barrier-free education. Tell us how this book sort of came together. Uh, whose idea was it first? Oh, it was Melody's. Okay. It was mine. <laughs> Okay, Melody, can I, then you, can I you... take this, Alex? May okay. I? I think Alex and Davey are going to be doing the bulk of the, uh, giving the information on the meet. Um, I was the facilitator, I would like to say, of this project. Um, of course, I knew Alex for years, and I'd seen Alex present, and Alex has come to Niigata to present for us, and I've seen her at JALT, and she even did a bilingual presentation at my university on working with neurodiverse students. And then I heard Davey speak about policy. Uh, I guess it was during COVID because I was uh, online. And I thought, oh my God, I have to get these people together. And I've been a series editor and author um, for Canlan and Minard for a few years now. And I thought uh, I can probably make this happen. I know how to, what to do to make this happen. So um, I brought uh, Davey and Alex in and they uh, very naively accepted. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and we started the book project and it was amazing. Um, we wrote a very good proposal. We got a lot of uh, excellent authors involved and our proposal was uh, accepted on the first try, which is, uh, no small feat. We had very good feedback from the uh, outside reviewers from Canlan and Minard. And uh, yeah, so that's how it started. Um, whoever talks next, uh, the person who's not talking, can someone go to Amazon, give us a screenshot or the Canlan and Minard website, a screenshot you can share uh, off the, uh, the screen so people can see what they're looking for. But Davey, I'll ask you the next question. Um, first of all, when did, when did Melody contact you? So when did this process really begin about um, getting together on this book? I remember, actually, I could tell you. Um, it, was, it was JALT 2020, which was online. I was sitting exactly where I am now, this, <laughs> at this table, this very spot, giving, I was, <laughs> I didn't even make it through my presentation. I was about halfway through my JALT presentation and then a, uh, you know, I, I I had been given host status or whatever to run my session. And I was about halfway through the session. And I was keeping an eye on the chat as questions were coming in. And I saw a question pop up and it was from Melody. And she said, <laughs> would you be interested in this collaborating on this book project? I hadn't even finished the presentation yet. So I, I waited to respond and, you know, uh, afterwards. And so it was... It was then <laughs> so basically it, four years ago I, and yes yeah early. yeah it was i guess november 2020 yeah yeah and during and at the same time during your presentation melody was messaging me on the side saying i'm just watching this amazing presentation you have got to hear what this guy's talking about we've got to get something together out of this and um yeah it was um, like literally probably all started within minutes yeah, I remember. Yeah, and we met. We had a we had Very a meeting organic. a couple of weeks later, December, I think, just before mm. the holidays, and we were off to the races. I've had a couple of moments the last um, couple of weeks that reminded me that 2020 and the Jolt the Jolt conference being one of those big events there was four years ago, and mm. uh, and just now I had a an actual tinge of nostalgia where like I go, wow, I miss those days because I wasn't feeling that way then. <laughs> I did not miss those days. Um, <laughs> If Davey was, was OTJ, then right? Say what? 
That was the birth of OTJ that that year. Oh, oh, that year, yeah, that was the yeah. There's um, but let's not go into that. Uh, yeah, I sure. want to talk about this. Um, I'm actually Davey, I think a screenshot right now. Thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, Davy, I think oh, Melody yes. mentioned that um, you were talking about um, uh, Barry Free in the classroom, and the uh, I think she mentioned it about governmental rules and changes applying to the classroom. About that, can you tell us what? actually has really taken effect now, or at least over the last couple of years, that maybe some teachers are not aware of in terms of what our obligations are as yeah. instructors I, on any level, junior high school, or there are a lot of people watching this um, that we should be aware of. Sure. Uh, I mean, I'm most familiar in terms of the, the sort of ob legal obligations and, and, um, uh, in terms of the legal obligations and the policy, I'm mo I'm best versed with the, uh, what's effective for higher education, just mainly because that's the context in which I teach. Um, and so my uh, familiarity with that kind of grew in tandem with my concern for inclusive language teaching uh, kind of happening around the same time, eight or nine years ago, uh, when I was in a program management position. So I uh, myself and three other people were uh, program managers for a, a large center, for a center that taught an English language course for all the first year students at this university. And it was in that role when I realized that we needed to be doing more to support our students, our self-disclosed students with disabilities. We would receive, you know, the slip of paper that said, these are the accommodations that need to be made. And then not much else was being done beyond that. And it was that experience that prompted me to sort of look into this policy. And so, um, or, you know, what our sort of legal obligations were. And it was in 2016 that the, um, actually, or 2015, sorry, 2015, the Act on the Elimination Against Persons with Disabilities uh, in Japan took effect. And that act is not specifically concerned with education. It's concerned with uh, the public and private sort of work sectors, but uh, higher education falls under that. And so um, it was from that time, from 20, well, it was passed in 2015, it took effect in 2016. And from 2016, it was legally mandated for all public universities to um, require, to offer reasonable accommodations to students with disabilities and faculty with disabilities as well. And um, it took some time for that to be legally required for private universities. Uh, a few years later, I think it was it was 2020, actually, that it passed the diet for that to be required for private universities. And that took effect this year. So academic year 2024, that act is finally applicable for mm -hmm. um, private universities as well. And it, it basically it's it's really quite short on what it says must be done. It just says reasonable accommodations must be offered. And that specific term is because of the influence of international policy. So there's a big international policy that came into effect um, in 2015, uh, 2014, 2015, called the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, well, it actually, well, the the the, the convention was earlier than that, but um, Japan historically uh, borrows a lot of of these this sort of policy language, not just in education, but in other things as well. Uh, from the United Nations governance. Um, so the term reasonable accommodations in the Japanese uh, legislature is is not really clearly defined, but we can look at the international policy guidance, which more clearly defines what reasonable accommodations are. Um, but it basically just means that uh, accommodations that are not an undue burden on the person supplying them, you know, or the institution or the employer supplying them must be offered to persons with disabilities. So that includes faculty, staff, and students. Um, and so then how that translates to practice in higher education really varies quite differently because, uh, and this is actually true, it's, so it's different, different policy uh, different sort of legal apparatuses for primary and secondary education, but something that you see happening at all levels is um, a there, there's not a uniform standard for what accommodations are offered because the the policy language allows for this interpretation of of what is what is undue or uh, what is an undue burden on the person or the institution supplying those accommodations, and so certain schools, um, be it elementary school or or universities will have uh, different support mechanisms in place. And that 
uh, also applies to the quality. There's a difference in quality in terms of the support mechanisms being offered. And I'm sure like talking to a lot of teachers and if you've, if those of you who are watching and, you know, in the Zoom meeting now, if you've talked, if you're aware of these issues, if you've talked to people, if you've worked at different universities, uh, you've probably, or different schools, you've probably noticed this, um, this difference in support from place to place. And so something I think that needs to happen and probably will not happen from a policy standpoint, it's something that needs to happen more bottom up rather than top down, is um, there needs to be more standardized support. There needs to be a, a higher quality of support kind of across the board. Um, but I think that that probably needs to be practitioner driven. Alex, you're well known for your work in promoting uh, things like inclusive teaching. To you, uh, with all of your experience and what you do right now, what is inclusive teaching to you? If, you, if I just came up to you and say, hey, I'm, I'm an ALT, I'm, I'm a teacher off the boat. Uh, what is this inclusive teaching? What would be a short form explanation of what it really means to you and what, what people should keep mm, in the front of their minds to be able to do it well? Hey, one of the things that's, um, which is becoming standardized and that's because of the influence of the Ministry of Education and the, and the um, uh, Disability Dis Discrimination Act. The, the, Discrimin the Discrimination Act was amended to include um, reading as a um, reading, uh, reading that is not sort of, um, not braille reading, which was, there was the option was there, but actually people who have a visual difference that prevents them from reading typically. And so one of the um, and one of the universities were had one of the things that's happened is that from um, 2021 the Ministry of Education has been requiring textbook uh, providers to offer audio, and we were able to do that because of the work of uh, one of our writers in the book, um, uh, Eiko Todo. She she was involved in getting the getting Japan to sign on to a copyright agreement. For educational purposes and that is how we have got audio at the fingertips of the students before audio was only ever available at the behest of the teachers and if you think about um language learning if you only ever hear something two or three times and you never hear it again it's difficult to um it is difficult to learn so for example here's an here's one i prepared earlier um this is a mm textbook that I've been um, and that's backwards but I've been involved in checking this for accessibility and there is um, this is from Alma Alma publishing and um, and they made a comment about universal design they've deliberately gone for universal design so if I were talking to somebody who was brand new to this I would be saying go and have a look at the textbook that the students are using and look for the QR codes. And if I were talking to a parent who might be watching, I would say to them, go get your kid to give you one of their textbooks and look for that QR code and scan it and see what happens. Because a lot of people don't actually realise that, um, that that's there. And, some, and in some cases, the students need the teacher to give them permission. Hmm. They need the sense of permission that, yeah, they can open this and they can listen to it any time they like. And that is really, really liberating. So this is the, and, and that that QR code factor is rippling through every book. All of the publishers are putting the audio up as a downloadable, and that is a direct consequence of the work of, um, um, like the very long term work of Eiko Toro to influence the getting audio for people. So Eiko has really changed. She's changed education in Japan. She's one of the most important factors in making life easier for people who um who have difficulty reading so yeah that's a practical thing look for the qr code a couple of things i want to mention uh for all the people who are joining us anew or are watching us uh, live on facebook uh we're going to be holding back from allowing people to open up their cameras and their microphones until the question and answer. So you have until then to come and join us. Uh, the link has changed uh, in the last uh, oh, couple of hours uh, from when I first posted it. So if you're not able to join, please link, uh, click the link uh, that is now on Facebook uh, for, the, uh, for the event and you'll be able to come into this room. Uh, also too, um, where is it here? Uh, um, 
Catherine uh, Akasaka mentioned, hey, can you put up that uh, link to the book to purchase on Amazon? I will try to do that while I'm trying to juggle everything else that's happening over here, uh, Catherine. But um, it's here in the Zoom room. If you want to come join us on the Zoom room and you can just click it over here in the chat. Um, yeah. Melody, did you, okay, I'll, I'll yes. try to give you a, a quick series of short uh, questions here. Were you aware of the need for inclusive teaching before you jumped on board with this project of getting the book? Yes, out? yes. And I, it was really thanks to Alex. I came, uh, the first time I met Alex, I think was, uh, she was doing a poster presentation at JALT. And I came Fancy. over to look at what she had. And I was so impressed by it. I'd never thought of these kinds of things. And a lot of the stuff she was showing, there, there were uh, tips for younger learners. And um, the bottle caps with the letters on them. And I learned about universal fonts. And I there were so many different things. And I and it really, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I, I'll self-identify as having ADHD. And I, I'm not dyslexic, but some of the things, the recommendations that Alex was giving were so resonant with me. It was like, well, yeah, well, yeah, of course. And uh, yeah, so that that really got me started in thinking so about So what this. I want to ask is, um, mm -hmm. did you find it more difficult trying to incorporate these things into your teaching? than what you were doing before you became aware of it. Not at all. In fact, I put in the um, in the Zoom chat, and I at some point, maybe later, I'd like to share. Uh, I think as a result of what Davy just said, uh, I was wondering why. It seemed out of the blue. I was asked by someone at my university to provide a very simple top 10 tips for teaching neurodiverse students. And we're mm. only giving it to the English teaching faculty, maybe that's to pilot this. Mm. I, I honestly have no idea, but I was asked to do this and I was very excited. And I came up with my list and I, I ran it through um, Davy and Alex. Um, now I'm having a senior moment. And what was your question? <laughs> I went off on a tangent. No, it's okay. <laughs> you basically answered it, I think, in the first uh, sentence. Okay. Has it, has it been difficult incorporating these things into your normal teaching? Oh, yes. No, no, it hasn't. Because, no, it hasn't. Okay. Um, over the years, I've been doing more and more of the things that I've been learning from Alex and Davey. Um, so those are some of the things that are on the list. Well, can I show it? May I sure. screen? Oh, while, you're, while you're showing it, I'll, I'll tell you why I asked that question. I ask because I think um, I, I get this sometimes when I'm talking about my oh, teaching. People yes. will say, yeah, but it looks like so much work. I've got to learn all of these new things. No, I've got to do no, all in, of these things. So for you, yeah, too. It, in fact, the kinds of tips that I'm offering are such simple little tweaks. Um, Okay, here it is. All right. So this is the, the sheet. And uh, thank you, um, Alex, for helping me clean it up a bit. So things like organization, you know, it's very simple. When you come into the classroom, write a list on the board of the day's activities and check them off as you go out, uh, uh, as you finish them. And the students, like myself, I had a teacher in university who did this and it really appealed to me. I thought, wow, I didn't realize I'd like to know where we're going, where we've been and where we're going next, I, I, where we are. I, I really, really appreciated that. And then, you know, uh, if you're using a, a blackboard or a whiteboard, um, some students cannot get the information orally only. So it's a good idea to write them on the board in you know, large print and in digestible short chunks and uh, and also modeling. Um, when you make your handouts, and this was a big one, and I really wanted to share this because I've seen some of my colleagues' handouts. I'm not going to name names, but I they, they struck me as, you know, print heavy or uh, uh, small fonts or or too many things on a page. And um, and and then I was able to, to work through working with Davy and Alex, uh, kind of clarify these kinds of things, like have the language and uh, and know what to do. So using sans serif fonts, and I give a list, and using ragged write 
It's a better kind of spacing. And what kind of color do you use? So strong contrast. I believe for PowerPoints, Alex recommends uh, light color on dark background. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, I usually, if, if I have an option, I use a chalkboard. If there's room for chalkboard, I do that. Okay. Yeah. And if there's no chalkboard, I usually go for, um, I usually use blue and okay. I don't, and I don't use black and red exclusively because black and red may look identical to people with certain forms of color vision differences. Right. So they can't. So if you highlight something in red, well, who knows? Because they look exactly the same or so marginally different. Or if you, if you label the colors, it's also yeah something on the that side of the do. side of the wall, um, corner of the board. Just write the names of the colors. Yeah. Um, the next one is uh, breaks. Um, because some students and I actually I was out for dinner with a co colleague last night and she was telling me she has a neurodiverse student and she's having a lot of trouble. And uh, and this is one of the things he, he needs to move around. So, you know, have the students get up and move and, and have a, bra a brain break, you know, or let off some some energy. Um, mixing the students, have them work with different classmates. And I think all of us who are English language teachers do pair work and group work. Mm -hmm. So this is an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that I started doing about materials. This I really was doing uh, thanks to COVID. I had to have everything available to the students all the time for those times when um, we weren't having a Zoom class because we didn't have enough bandwidth at the university if the students were there and I was at home. I elected, because I'm high risk, I elected in the second semester, although some classes went back to face-to-face -face in 2020, I elected to stay home. So I was doing, I, I wasn't there and, and my, I couldn't use Zoom. But I, so I had to make all the materials available in a Google Drive and I still do that. and. And another benefit of this is some students need extra time for processing. They need to see the video again, or they need to see the PowerPoint again, or or anything that you give them. Um, so this is really good. And then about technology, and Alex and Davey know more th about this than I do. I knew this was a good recommendation to have. And I was given um, this uh I, I, I took a look online to find these uh, technological tools. So one of them is text to speech and the other one is speech to text. So giving teachers an idea of what kind of software they can, can give to their students. And then finally, and this is something I started doing, is uh, I give my students every year at the beginning of the semester, if it's a new group of students, I give them an information sheet to fill out. I want to know, did they go to Juku before? Have they been abroad? Blah, blah, blah. What are their hobbies? Blah, blah, blah. And then now I ask them, I have a question, which is what can I do to help you learn better? And I put a few examples on. So students will tell me, you know, please write the instructions on the board. Please speak slowly. Please write in large letters. And so this is, uh, these were all like really, easy fixes um, and I think they are all part of good practice just generally it's good practice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 they appeal to um, all students so I will close that mm. um Alex yep so I just wanted to add one point um maybe it uh, maybe it got edited was that I always use planned uh, rotations in my classes. I never have the students go and look for a partner because yeah. anyone who's experienced being excluded mm -hmm. is automatically going to be terrified mm -hmm. of not being mm -hmm. included. And mm -hmm. we really don't want them to be scared. And so I have on the board, and I've used this in elementary, junior and senior, and also kindergarten and a university, I have on the board, this is what the lines look like, and this person's going to stand still, and everybody else is going to go in this direction. You're going to go one person. And I get them to look at eye, co eye contact with the person they're going to be talking to next. And that, uh, and I make those rotations fairly fast. They don't spend more than about two minutes with the same person so that if they're scared of somebody or they um, find somebody intimidating, they don't have to stay with them for that long. But they, they are people who would never get to talk 
have a chance to talk and it reduces the stress in the room. Um, and if I, if I, oh, sorry, I just wanted go, to add go, go. To, to that. Um, I, I also, uh, that was another recommendation I was giving my friend last night was that I, when the students are doing group work, I always count off the groups. I don't really allow them to choose because they will choose their friends will always mm. be and you'll end up as Alex said with some students feeling left out and students who are neurodivergent it's good for or neurodiverse it's good for them to have as many experiences with different people they will f probably find some people easier easier to work with than other people mm -hmm. maybe and this guarantees that that they can do that so I, I count them off um, myself. And I, I remember one year, I, I learned that from uh, one class I had at another university, um, that people who are friends, or if you have a, a class, which is a, in a predominantly female dominated subject, which we have, uh, if there are many, ma any male students in the class, they're going to sit together, they're going to feel like they're yeah. supposed to. And then they may not work that well together because I, I realized once I separated um, two male students and started moving them myself into um, other groups, they were working more. Mm. Yeah. Just a, just a quick comment on what you and Alice are talking about in terms of dynamic seating, which is what I call it. Um, I think, although I've never done a survey on it or anything, because you know that if you ask a question, your students are all going to like give the answers they think the teacher wants. But I think uh, ever since, I mean, it's been 20 years now, I've been using dynamic seating. I think they're kind of happy that they're not told to go and look for someone who's not their friend. They're just happy that they finally get a chance jumping over the problem of peer pressure and everything else to mm. actually talk to everybody in the room. Yep. You know, the, like Melody just said, there, there's a little bit of peer pressure to just stay within your group, but now yes. they generally will speak to, sometimes twice to some people. Question, yeah. Open question for everybody. Um, well, can I just, sorry, but before we move on, I just want to piggyback the one thing I noticed sort of as we're talking about that, I notice everybody's sort of talking about the way that this kind of dynamic seating, as you call it, which is wonderful. And, you know, I have my own sort of system for doing the same thing. Um, we're, we're, we've all been talking about how that benefits student, neuro, neurodiverse students or students with mm -hmm. disabilities. But I think it's also really important to emphasize that that kind of uh, changing of groups and mixing of groups is incredibly important for students without disabilities in the classroom mm -hmm. as well, because it helps students without disabilities become more socially comfortable engaging with people who are different from them. Yep. We yep. often yep. talk about like, this this kind of um, interaction is often framed as like knowledge transmission from people without disabilities to disabilities. And I think mm -hmm. that that's really kind of wrong or it's really one sided. We need to also think about knowledge transmission the other way as well. And this yes. kind of improve this is going to create an inclusive ethos in your in your classroom and in your school. And this is going to help, um, you know, socialize students to interacting with people from different backgrounds not just not just neurodiverse students, but, you know, different genders and socioeconomic backgrounds and race and so on and so on. This is going to help these students um, gain this sort of competence uh, as they, well, later on in life as they exit schooling. So I just I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that. Absolutely. Alex. Um, yeah. Another thing, um, like in the chat, we've got uh, in, in the room, we've got several people, one of whom was uh, uh, one of whom is Mark Helgerson and Professor Helgerson. I watched him oh many years ago saying how he asked the, the, the students, how would they arrange the room? Because the room was being, the, the format of the room was being changed. And so he asked them, how would, how do you think we should structure the room, the, uh, the, the conversation, uh, the uh, oral communication room? Shall we have him, shall we have him um, explain it himself? Um, I, I don't know if he's actually there. I should probably ask him first if he's there. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to ask him to unmute and if he, I I mean, there you are, Mark. I don't really remember what I said, Alex. <laughs> yeah, you said you you told that you gave the students the option of arranging arranging the room, and they made different blocks of spaces with the chairs that were available, and they made a space of the room that had no chairs in it at all. And um, yeah, it was one. It was from maybe it was a language lab before, and then suddenly it was an open space, and so you gave the students the ability to choose what would work for them. And I thought that really impressed me that that was you were it, you were bringing them into 
the environment. And um, Sean, um, just recently in the in the mind and brain think tanks in Neurover Neurodiversity 3, Sean Toland has talked about how he does that in his room. He asked, specifically asked for rooms with flexible furniture. Mm. And all of the bags and things go around the edge of the room and he's made makes the room into about eight pods of desks. And then, so instead of the focus being on him at the, as a teacher at the front of the room all the time, it's now it's a much more dynamic environment and i really liked um i really liked that um image that sean came up with and he said it made it really improves the communication open question for um anybody in the three um, of course, uh, trying to um, cater to the needs of all students, uh, neurotypical, neurodiverse, is a legal requirement now. But um, specifically for English students, is there a specific task or a specific um, uh, barrier that you don't find teaching history, you don't find teaching biology, um, that would be important for us as English teachers to keep in mind? Um, sometimes these things are not as obvious as they would be. Although, you know, when you're sitting in Japan talking with English teachers, you think, oh, well, we're all talking about teaching English. But is there something like, for example, having to learn a completely different script uh, at um, 11 years old, at 10 years old, is there something that makes that even harder for neurodiversity? It's that you differently know? hard, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's a few different, um, a couple different notable differences that spring to mind. Um, the first thing, the, the way that I always frame it is um, sort of content teachers, you know, to, to someone teaching high school social studies or history or math or what have you, um, they're generally teaching declarative knowledge. Uh, they're teaching students how to, they're teaching students content, right? Whereas with language learning, we're, we're teaching um Scale. Not declarative knowledge. What's the, I'm forgetting. I'm blanking on it now. It's in chapter three. Um, the, they're, it, it's interactive knowledge. Like the, the, the knowledge that we teach is, is used. Like we're, we're using what we teach. We're teaching what we use concurrently, right? Um, they're not just learning about English. They're learning how to use English. And mm -hmm. so that's uh, different from teaching content um, or, or, you know, social studies or history teacher, what have you. And so that completely changes, I think, how we might, you know, scaffold and so on. Now, I'm not saying that that we're not prepared to do that because we've if you're a language teacher and you've been trained as a language teacher, you know how to do that already. But what that means is that a lot of inclusive practices in language teaching are borrowed and get mapped over from general education. So people take like UDL, for example, like universal design for learning, and let's apply it to language learning. But the fact of the matter is uh, there are, there are parts of these sets of practice that don't completely transfer and map over to language learning environments because we're not teaching declarative knowledge. Um, so that's something to keep in mind just as we're teaching. And so I think that that it changes, you know, how we do scaffolding and modeling. It means I think we have to have, you know, uh, an extra degree of scaffolding, uh, an extra degree of multimodality, um, and uh, a greater tolerance of error, which which I think we have as language teachers because making errors is part of language learning. Um, but what that also means is uh, for language learning is there are different sort of cognitive and affective factors that are at play that aren't necessarily going to... Um, uh, present in other in other classrooms, and so knowing how uh, language how certain specific learning difficulties, for example, affect language learning and production, especially production, I think can be beneficial. And that's sort of like a separate talk. I mean, I don't want to take us on a big tangent talking about that, but I, I think it's important for language teachers to kind of educate themselves about this. And there are lots of wonderful resources to be available about that. And this, in this just one sort of final note, and then I'll let someone else speak. Um, this also relates to affective factors. And so, you know, it's one thing if you're a neuro neurodivergent or neurodiverse student to sit in a, a history classroom, if you don't like to sort of talk a lot and you can sit and you can learn and you can demonstrate your learning very effectively through your written essay or whatever you have to give. Whereas in a language learning classroom, oftentimes that demonstration of learning 
is is productive and interactive. And so this can really, really spike like foreign language anxiety. So students right. that can succeed that, are, you know, can succeed in other classrooms might have trouble succeeding in language classrooms because their anxiety spikes when mm -hmm. they're made to mm -hmm. present or speak or write or what have you. And this can really be really tricky for language teachers too. Like if you teach, like, like I teach a composition class. If I have students who their anxiety spikes when they have to write in English, then I, I have to, you know, bend over backward. And I, I do my best to try and accommodate that. But at the end of the day, I'm still teaching writing. And so it gets really tricky. I don't want to say difficult because it's possible. We can make accommodations, but the, the accommodations that you could make in a content class are not necessarily the same that you can make in a language class because the, the medium of instruction is also the content, is also what we're teaching. Um, so I think it makes it, it makes it tricky. Yeah. Alex. Um, yeah, I wanted to jump in on this um, and talk about something that you do, uh, Jose. Jose, during the pandemic, Jose started teaching all of the, anyone who will listen, sort of anybody who's part of, sort of the, the OPD <laughs> people who community, didn't. the JALP community, et cetera. He's made these amazing videos on the process of teaching students to use um to effectively use verbs in sentences. And he had us all practicing, I am happy, you are happy, he is happy, she is happy, we are happy, they are happy. I could not do that fluently myself. Thanks to Jose, I can. And um, I've been using that in my classes. I use it when I get it before I prepare students if they to do any kind of writing or, or presentation skill stuff. I get them to practice these things. And I know Adam Jenkins also does this with his students. Ad Adam is a very big online um, learning, um, self-paced learning advocate. And he said that when he has students in the class, no matter what he's teaching them, he is applying that verbal classroom technique. And I've seen the result of that has been that students make less errors in their writing hmm. when they go to write something about their history or about the history of somebody else for a presentation, they are less likely to make grammatical errors but just ne recently, this semester, I've had a couple of students who have um, stammering issues. And so in my classes now, I actually do a one-minute interview with all of my students, like all 400 of them. I do that in the very beginning of the course, and I get the others to talk or do something during that time. And I notice what's going on with their reaction to me and any speaking things. And it occurred to me that now a few weeks in, when I've been listening to the classes, I don't hear anybody stammering. And I have been using that verbal classroom method. So I would like to say, yay, to Jose, for teaching us to do that. And I'd like you very briefly to talk about how would you, why would you bring that into a class and how fastly, how quickly could you do it? Why I would bring um, it in because I quite naturally am quite convinced that it's the best way to teach a class. However, I don't want to take up any more of the time for the three of you to talk about what you're here to do. I will tell you this. The other day I went to chat GPT and bef before I went there like a couple days ago, uh, I would ask it, who's Jose Domingo Cruz and what's verbal classrooms? And it would utter total garbage. Like sometimes it would hallucinate and talk about a baseball <laughs> player or verbal classrooms is where everybody's talking all at the same time. And so, yeah, that's kind of not really it. Uh, but I did it the other day and it spot on. It, um, it, it, and it actually tells you where its references are now, which is really nice. So if you really do want to learn more about uh, verbal classrooms, type in who is Jose Domingo Cruz and what is verbal <laughs> classrooms? And you, you don't have to type it. You can say it. You know, it, it'll do that. It'll it'll save you some wear and tear on your fingertips. And it'll actually give you the references and, and where you can get the information. Um, that You might even be able to do that in maybe a couple of weeks for what is barrier-free instruction in Japan. And it'll give you a, a, a great big lowdown on the book. However, we don't need that right now. We have uh, our three authors here. So I'll, I'll t just say this to the three authors. Um, I'll give you just a, maybe a few seconds to think about, uh, believe it or not, we've been at this almost 45 minutes now, and it feels like we just stepped onto the pavement. Uh, but uh, I want to give as much time as possible also to Q&A. So I'm going to start opening up uh, the rooms. Uh, now, in between that, if you guys could just think about if you want to just sort of have a final statement before we go to Q&A, you want to say something that you haven't 
uh, had a chance to, you haven't been asked or something you really want to leave the audience with before we go to Q&A, uh, think about it now. Uh, for the audience, I will now be, uh, where's host tools? I will now allow you to unmute yourselves and start your video. And uh, Q&A is coming up. So please think about any questions. I'm sure there are a bunch that you want to ask um, um, Davey and Alex and Melody. Uh, I have one point that I want to make, though. I don't know if Dar Watson is still watching us on the Facebook Live, but you seem to have pushed the angry uh, emoji on the Facebook Live reactions. <laughs> and I don't know if that was because, you know, yeah, damn the government for, for making us do this or something. Uh, but it, it kind of looks like, you know, you've got an angry emoji on, on the Facebook Live. I don't know if that was purposeful. If it was, then please leave it there. If not, <laughs> please keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Um, so final word before we go to Q&A, Davey. I mean, I just, I'll, I'll go first, maybe because I thought of something right off the bat. Um, something I always like to say when I'm, you know, presenting or, or doing a, an inset or something like this. Um, I, I really, really, really can't emphasize highly enough how, so we, we've talked a lot about um, classroom practices, what we can do to, to be inclusive in the classroom, but there's a lot of inclusive practices that happen outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so shout out to Michael Yap, to Mike Yap for, he, he mentioned earlier up in the chat, talking about the importance of reflective practice. Um, for inclusive teaching, that's hugely important. So there's a lot of things we can do outside of the classroom as well, just to prepare ourselves and get ready for teaching in the classroom, as well as offering students out, outside of class support. But one of the absolute most important, helpful things you can do if you want to be a more inclusive teacher is, is engage in a community of practice. Talk to your colleagues about what you can do better, how you can teach better. That is a hugely important thing. And I always bring that up in these moments because we're doing that right now. Like this, this kind of engagement um, is so hugely beneficial just to sort of talk ideas out for yourself, to help other people along. And that goes so much further than just your own classroom because it, this is how we sort of transform the field. I mean, I've I've said it a million times. I, I say it in chapter one of the book and I'll, I'll say it here again. We need to reach like a critical mass. If we get a critical mass of inclusively minded teachers, we suddenly tip the scale. And if we can get, you know, this the kind of proper training for teaching inclusively in MATSOL programs, for example, you know, this sort of these, it's incremental change. And I really, really, really sincerely hope that in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, we won't need to have these conversations anymore because mm -hmm. it's just standard practice. But a big, 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 big part of that is talking about it. Talk with your colleagues, talk with other JALT members talk to anybody you know about it. I mean, obviously, obviously you've got other things to talk, to talk about. You don't have to talk about it all the time, but like make space in your professional life for having these kinds of discussions. It's hugely impactful. So that's, that's my quick, last thing. Let's quick comment on that. Uh, online Teaching Japan still is a vibrant community that allows people to talk about all kinds of things uh, more often these days than, than before, uh, things that are not immediately uh, connected to online teaching, but there's also online teaching Japan off topic. Otherwise, uh, just get out there, pound the keys, uh, as Davy said, and just start engaging the community. Uh, Alex, Melody, anything you wanted to mention before we go to- Melody? Um, I just wanted to say, um... Something that, and then again, this is a practice that works for all students, uh, scaffolding. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I do when I do group present, uh, when my students are doing group work is um, they are assigned roles and they junk in for the roles. And so the students know what is expected of them. I spend a whole class at the beginning of the semester uh, where the students have a variety of topics they have to talk about and they keep changing roles. And the roles are a uh, leader. The leader's job is to make sure everybody has a chance to speak and to keep the task in English as much as possible. The recorder who takes notes for the group, the reporter who is the speaker for the group, and then any other members of the group are, are participants. And they junk in, the students junk in before the activity starts, and then they know what is expected. And when I do the first class, I, I devote a whole class to this. Uh, we keep changing the topic and they keep changing the role and they see how we do the discussion. So they know immediately what they need to do. And I think that's really good for um, students who want to know what is expected of them. And I think because the transition, especially for first, first year 
language students, and I'm talking about university level, uh, they're coming from such a different way of learning. They're coming from a teacher fronted into a student centered situation. And they have to learn how to transition. And I think it's important when the students are learning, are going to be doing something high risk and different from what they are used to. It's really good to train them how to do that. Cool, Alex. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to speak on that issue of training and actually going to do a little tiny hands-on training thing for you right now that I hope will make your life um, life more easy um, as a teacher. And if those of you who've got iPhones want to want you to break them out right now or iPads, break them out, open them up, have them ready. I'm just going to share my um, share my screen now. Let me see. I'm going to go through. I'm going to go advanced advanced options with my iPad via cable. And here we go iPad by cable. Share. Okay, here it comes. Right, trust. I'm going to trust it. Yes, please. I want to trust this. Um, is it not sharing? No, no, no. no. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, no, but it's no, we don't see blank. your iPad yet, though. Uh, hang on a second. Let me just reconnect it because this the iPad is central to this process. Just try again. Okay, and share. I'm going to share iPad by cable and share. Okay, oh, right. You can now see um, this is going on something that Melody just talked about. I'm teaching students to do a, um, I'm using a, an app called um, uh, called Freeform. Can you see it yep. on my screen? Yep. Okay, so the students have got, um, I'm actually asking my students to create a presentation, but I want the, them to create a barrier-free presentation. And they need to use the right grammar tenses. So I'm actually getting them to incorporate, and this is probably upside down. Yeah, this is upside down. But it's got, uh, this is Betty Azard's grammar charts. And I use that because you can actually see the parts of English tenses. You can see them. You can make a line of it. You can draw it. So I'm using that. I'll have to turn that the right way around. I also have given them an example of what I want to have from their finished product, what I want it to look like. And I've shown them that on the screen, uh, when you're doing a presentation, you have a section which is um, you have a section which is the um, um, you know the headings. You have a title for so I know who they are, so that it doesn't just say presentation, English presentation, which doesn't help me. And that down the bottom, that they have a block to put their uh, put their sentences because we don't want posters to be full of text. So they've got that. Then they have to go through the contrast checker to check that their uh, content is not going to be difficult for somebody who has a different color experience to them. Mm -hmm. So they have to go through this. And lastly, I get them to look at this website, which is accessibility in practice. It's the Japanese version of a UK document, the, um, the home office documents. And inside that is a section on um, it's thing, do's and don'ts for producing accessible material. And I actually have the whole class. I give them teacher experience. Somebody comes up to the board and says, shiru koto, and everybody goes, repeat, shiru koto, which is do this, shirai koto, don't do this. They actually have that sort of, uh, that, it makes it fun. But I point out, please don't use, uh, don't use italics, don't use, um, um, don't use the um, uh, all caps, and don't use underline. So the students, when they saw this, that this is all the things they're integrating to make their presentation, the lights just went on. And I taught them how to bring color in from a picture. And they, and this is this is Friday afternoon on a non-majors on a Friday afternoon last lesson. And these kids were riveted by this process. I was so proud of them. But maybe you might find your screen a little hard to use. So I'm going to show you a trick. Um, I want you to click on the, the settings button, the settings icon. I wish I should have my mouse pointer show this a bit better. The settings button, I'm going to click on that. And now I want you to go to accessibility. And it's on the menu. You go down. It's just under general. It's on the menu there. 
and accessibility. I want you to go all the way to the end. I'm going to slow, do this slowly, slowly. I'm going to get down to per app settings. Now, when you look at this per app settings, you can change the font. So here's Facebook. I want to have larger text in Facebook, so I'm going to increase it, and I can see how big that font is going to be. And maybe I want to have, I want to do differentiate without color. Maybe I want to do that. Okay, I'll do that too. Hmm. And so I could, maybe I don't want to have animation. Automatic animations? No, don't want those. I'm going to leave that turned off. And I'm going to go back. But I've also set that up for Safari and Quizlet and hmm. Google Docs and all of the apps that I use. And I know this has been of enormous benefit to um, to one of our people in the audience, another one of our famous uh, neurodiverse people, Heather McCulloch. And Heather has a kind of um, neurodiversity and her vision is called retin retinitis pigmentosa. I think I've got that right around. And so she has a section of the screen that's available to her. And this, I think, um, I mean, Heather could say that herself, but this is this has made a big difference to her speed at which she can react to things. And so that's it. So um, what I'm talking about there was it's an iPhone function. People who are on um, Android, I really hope somebody can test that. I don't know if you have a global function like uh, the per app settings. Maybe you do, but look for that and change your uh, change your per app settings, and it's right at the very bottom of the page. Okay, All right, and that is um, that's pretty much enough for me. Oh, oh no, it isn't. My it never is. No, I know it isn't. Mike, Mike, yeah, do you have a picture stop, of... Stop sh sharing. Um, oh, okay, Alex. yeah, yeah, okay, right. Um, Heather is there. I don't know if Heather wants to make a comment on that. Um, the only other person I wanted to... Oh, there she is. She's unmuted. Yay. Hi, thank you. Hi. Hi, Heather. Thank you for telling me about that. That has really made a huge difference. Uh, some apps on my phone, I... Um, I couldn't see them before and then just being able to set them at the size that I want them has just really made a huge difference. The only app that it doesn't work with is Basecamp. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, if you can figure out or Jose could Figure no, I out. was I wasn't gonna comment on that. Um I would just make sure that Basecamp is at its newest version that your um, mobile device is at its newest version and uh -huh. that um depending on a lot of things i i don't i'm just i'm just shooting out suggestions in the dark uh, if it still doesn't work one thing you can try is to remove base camp and then reinstall it and then try again to see if that shakes anything out of the tree but oh, no it, i i don't have base camp it, it half works and it half yeah. doesn't so i set it yeah. the text bigger and mm -hmm. so um, like if a if a message comes in, the title of the message is at the size that I set it. But then I click on that. When I go into the message itself, then the message itself is tiny. The title is big and the message is tiny. So every single message that I get, I have to screenshot each message, mm. go to my camera, zoom in, mm. go back to Basecamp, type it out take a screenshot of what I've typed, go and check and see if I've made any mistakes. And then if I've made a mistake, then I've got to go back to Basecamp and find it and fix right. it. The only yeah, other but... thing I can, the only other thing I can suggest, Heather, is that if you are at your wit's end and all you can do is replicate the, the problem is to use the screen recording on the phone or the mobile device to walk through the entire situation and save that and send that as a message to Basecamp through their error reporting. People will mm. think, oh, that's kind yeah. of yes. pointless and uh, I don't have the time, but you might be saving mm. somebody else uh, mm -hmm. with even fewer resources than you have from this hellacious situation by actually going to Basecamp who themselves might not have any idea that this is happening. And sometimes some 
uh, developers for an app can be very responsive and say, oh, we didn't even have any idea. Thank you. And they'll start working with you and you could just, you know, really pave the way for a lot of people who have your problem. Well, I, I, I think developer. I'm going to do that. No, I'm, I'm now when I get like the base camp jingle on mm -hmm. my phone, you know, the notification jingle. Mm -hmm. I get a stomach ache. Yeah, I, I, I remember that yeah. feeling. I remember that yeah. feeling with a few different situations. Um, I completely. Just the uh, process is yeah, painful. I'm really, I'm really with you. And uh, I want to stay on that point. I want to say how uh, impressed I am with the way that Jout, as an organisation, has mm. responded to this. Um, Heather, I'm going to share share that document that I made so that people can see what does the screen look like to you. If that's okay with you, I'm just going to share that. Um, and here it is. It's uh, where is it? Share. Yep, trust it. Yep, let's go. Come on, let's trust. And no, come on, I'll just have to unplug and redo. Okay, it might it's something to do with the um, the sharing process. Okay. Maybe give that a try. Oh, oh here it is. Right. Yeah. Bingo. People, pay, people, have a look at that. And so I sent that image to the the head of the um, technology and assisting assist, uh, technology. I can't even remember the acronym now. I'm actually on it. So, and I was in, immediately <laughs> invited into the group to um, to to actually how do we make this a reality to make things easier within Jout? And I'm really really proud of the fact that within um, less than one year. Jout has taken so many steps to make the entire web website interface better, and it's getting better all the time. And that was everybody wants um, everybody in the organisation to be able to do to do things. And so that is literally what when uh, when when Heather's saying that she she has retin uh, retinitis pigmentosa, that is what she's seeing. So you can imagine that in a Zoom, and people are hurling things in a chat if you can't maximize it to your own settings. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I showed you all how to use that, that adjust um, accessibility, adapt your environment, because when you do that, you actually engage with the, the reason for making your classroom accessible. Mm. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, Alex. Uh, last thing is, Mike, did you happen to have a picture of that flow chart? Could you put that up on the screen? While Mike, Mike yeah. is uh, looking for his flowchart, I've got to make sure that everyone yep. can actually share. Uh, mm -hmm. But now let's go on to the Q&A because uh, believe it or not, now we're at an hour. And um, I, I would love for this to go on if you guys are okay with this going on. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, and now, um, if you have a question, I would very much appreciate it, uh, not just to raise your hand uh, on the camera, but to raise your hand using the reactions buttons. Uh, and um, so then I know who has a question by looking at the, the list of raised hands. But otherwise, uh, please uh, open up your camera, uh, unmute if you want to speak, and uh, we'll start uh, by asking a few questions uh, of our uh, illustrious panel here. Brent. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you to everybody today. It's very interesting as usual. This is a very interesting area. But unfortunately, I'm going to be a bit negative here. So I've written everything down. So I've taken advice from Alex in the past. How do you convince um, teachers about neurodiverse practices? Um, I've posted several things on notice boards and things like that, like uh, similar to Melody's list today. And you often get the reaction, oh, yeah, well... <laughs> Brent means well. You know, he's an ever such a nice chap. He really means well. And then the, the, we're talking about uh, disruptive students, and then they, the, the conversation will automatically switch to, yeah, well, what we need to do is chuck them out of the classroom. So how do you, how do you convince teachers that they're going in the wrong direction? And also another thing that well, is sort of connected is that a lot of the um, suggestions made, for example, <clears throat> different partners organising the blackboard properly, they're made on you know the first week of a ba basic CELTA course, and 
teacher training is before you come is also ridiculed in Japan to a certain extent. So, so sorry to sound a bit negative, but so how Brent, are you sorry, Brent, to interrupt? Are you talking about how do you convince your Japanese teachers or other teachers I'm within Jalder? Talk about teach just uh, normal teachers, every all teachers, whether they're American or Australian, Japanese, Vietnamese, whatever. Every, every all English teachers. I mean, I I would just say there, there's any number of arguments that you can make for individual people, um, but before sort of getting into any of those, I would just say, referring back to to my sort of parting word about communities of practice, um, a, a lot of these issues, I, I don't think it's about convincing any one single teacher that you're talking to. Obviously, you know, you want to be able to do that, and we hope to be able to do that. But I think it's also important to to try and and, and shift the, the field and shift the thinking. Again, I think that if we can, you know, over time, we're, we're not necessarily going to change a single person's mind through one discussion. I'd like to be able to do that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try. But um, I think it's important also to focus on having discussions, just the, 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 the usefulness of, of talking about these issues and there's a slow sort of erosion of these kinds of attitudes if these if the discussions are just out there and open. And then that being said, there's any number of, of small points that can be made that I think you have to sort of tailor to who you're talking to um, and sort of what their specific concerns are. Um, because some people have concerns about like the sort of workload, like it's more work. And to which I always say, actually, it's not. You're just, you do the work now so you're not doing more work later. You know, that's, it's a it's a it's a prevention preventative medicine versus treatment you know kind of analogy um that's sort of one one line of reasoning that you can take for a specific concern um people that that jump to sort of behavioral issues i used to deal with that a lot um when i was managing teachers and i would always oftentimes when people would bring up things like behavioral issues they would they suspected that students had a disability. They didn't have a diagnosis. They're like, I have students that act up in class and they're disruptive. So I think they must. And I would just say, slow down, you know, back it up. We don't know that you're not, you're not, a, you're not trained in, in a diagnosing di learning disabilities, you know, so to speak. Um, and so, and then just focusing on what the teachers can do in their teaching to help reduce disruption. So rather than focusing on like shifting the discussion rather than being, okay, well, let me, let me talk to you about teaching inclusively saying with, with those specific teachers, let me talk to you about how you can teach in a way to re reduce disruption. Because from what I'm hearing from you is that you want to have less disruption in your class. So let's talk about ways we can teach to have less disruption, mm -hmm. right? And just sort of shifting the conversation in a way that's going to lead that teacher to doing things more inclusively, but you're not, you know, um, you're not, um, uh, triggering them by talking about, <laughs> you know, inclusive practices. You're, you're speaking to their immediate concerns, which is having disruptive students in the class. Um, so again, I think that like, like I said, just having, having conversations in general, help shift the field, um, and help change people's minds over time. And then secondly, I, I, I respond differently to different teachers based on their specific concerns. Um, and just to do that, you know, just to do that with empathy, you know, because I think oftentimes when teachers, when they have these sorts of complaints, when people complain, they, they want to be heard first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so letting people sort of, you know, that some my hackles go up a lot of the times when I hear people sort of do that, because I, I have a reactionary, why don't you, why, why don't you care about this kind of attitude? But if I can, if, if you can sort of swallow that and just speak to their immediate concerns, oftentimes you end up winning them over you know, incrementally. That's been my experience anyway. Okay. Well, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And another thing is, you know, higher level, you're, you're at university, you're working at university. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So find out if there's a, if there's an FD committee, mm, that's um, good. I'm on the, I'm on the FD committee actually. And one of the reasons I wanted to be on it was because I wanted to bring in people like Alex, which I did the first year brought Alex in to actually no that was uh, that was later but um uh that was when my colleague was on the fd committee and he said do you have an idea i have no idea i said oh alex burke should come in and talk about um you know <laughs> working with uh, neurodiverse students and that was one of the most well attended events that we had 
so many teachers on my campus came to that. Alex gave a bilingual talk and that was just great. And so there, people wanted the information. Mike, hmm. you're muted, by the way. There you go. Hi, Alex, Melody, Hi. and Davey. Hi. Um, I know all of you are in higher education, and as far as higher, higher education is concerned, uh, Davey has written about this uh, a lot, that we were in. Students have the, the right to withhold information about their <laughs> neurodiversity. However, because I am in a secondary education setup, um, I do believe that responsibility falls on the parents, whether they would disclose the condition of their children. Um, I've been trying to scar uh, resources from the government, whether that is actually mandated. Have you come across that? And if you have, can you share that in the chat? Um, I don't have a specific uh, resource for you off the top of my head to share in the chat, but as I understand it, st um, students are, their parents are legally required to disclose if they have a diagnosis, but that gets gray in higher ed in um, high school. High school is sort yeah. of a gray area, and it, depending on the type of school that you go to, like public or private, um, That's true. The, the, the students have a little bit more um, self-determination. The, parent, the, the parents have more uh, right to autonomy. Yeah, um, but I don't I think, I, because I don't work in that context or do research in that context. I don't. Um, I'm about ninety five percent certain on what I just said, but I have a little bit of doubt, mm. and I don't unfortunately have the like le legislation close to hand. But that's um, okay. I'll support for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think the mandate falls on primary and junior high school. Right. Uh, high school just diverges. Um, right now, there is a gray area on that. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, that's complicated because even if um, even if a a school uh, works with the family to put the student through, they're identified early, mm -hmm. and even even in elementary school, kindergarten, elementary school, and that family, the child is identified. the t The family has the choice whether or not to to agree to any intervention. Mm -hmm. at all. That's true. Yeah, that's and true. so uh, the the Ministry of Education did a research in 2022, and they found that 8.8 percent .8 of children in mainstream classes in elementary and junior high school appear to have a specific learning difficulty without any evidence of intellectual disability. So, and this are this is this is the research that was done through the teachers, right, Alex? Uh, that was the one. Was what the teachers believed, and this is before right. the teachers were trained. But that they were teachers were asked in your classrooms, do you have children who appear to have difficulties with mm -hmm. um, reading, writing, mathematics, and you know, like learning activities? Do they appear to have difficulties with those, but don't appear to have an intellectual disability? And they mm -hmm. said it was about 8.8%. That was also static for junior high school, 8.8%. Public high schools are 2.2%. Yes. And that's because a lot of the students who have those learning differences didn't have the, um, the, the resources just weren't there for them to use. Mm -hmm. And so they would go into, uh, they'd be more likely to go into private institutions. Some of them would be um, going leaving school to go to work by mm -hmm. the time they're in high school. And uh, right. some of them might be staying in their houses. And so this is a very long-term plan of MEX to mm. bring the tools together for the students so everyone has access to a uh, every one student, one device, um, irrespective of means, and mm. the teachers are being trained in how to, um, how to use those. And so that is, I think Japan is actually well-placed for... To, to provide actual um, inclusive learning to, to, to the extent that people are aware of how to use the books and mm -hmm. to the extent that the students are given the options to use those things, like using headphones in the classroom. Um, that is the, and that's a training issue, you know, and Corona was a big blip. Corona deeply affected the training process of using um, using the um, um the tools effectively, but now the, there is the option of digital um, learning through the textbooks. Mm. 
And I've seen it used by students in elementary school who were listening, obviously using the QR codes at home and singing the chants and practicing Mm -hmm. the dialogues because their, their pronunciation was amazing and there was no other obvious reason for them to know those dialogues by heart. So mm-hmm. if if you build it, they will come. If you give the the tool, people will use it. That's true. That's true. Anyone else they would like to ask a question of the panel? Mark. Yeah, this is just a, a uh, comment point more than a question. But I find it very useful to tell my students early on that I have learning disabilities, because I'm trying to do two things. Number one, a lot of my students are education majors. So I want them to see that, hey, you can you can be LD and have, and, and be a good teacher. I also, I, I happen to be dyscalculic, which is a disability that, that affects numbers. And I'm the person who gives them grades, which are numerical (laughs) so it means check your grade and if it doesn't seem right talk to me and it kind of makes it like okay to talk about where otherwise i mean so often it's just it's a taboo and just a minor point but i find it useful to to share that with my students and glenn Hi, right. thanks everybody. I think I know almost everybody in the room. I got a quick one here. Um, what do you recommend for a way for teachers to identify neurodiverse issues in students as early as possible compared to whether they're just simply a low level English learner? They don't have the motivation because they don't think that their major is going to use English in the work. It's concerning to me because next year, one of my universities is uh, basically changing from a 90 to a 100 minute uh, length on its courses, thereby cutting me a whole lesson during the semester. How do you ID these kids early? I mean, I would just quickly answer to say the the, the focus shouldn't be on I, identifying them. The focus should be on uh, adapting your instruction to maximize their their learning. And so taking a student who you may suspect has a specific learning difficulty or something, but rather than, than, you know, the suspicion is enough for you to say, okay, let me now focus on this student's difficulties and how I can minimize them and help maximize their learning. Yeah, but David, there's so many issues. I'm sorry, say again? There's so many issues. Yeah. How am I supposed to keep track of 25, 23... 29 kids and know that this one's got the retinitis problem. This one's got a dyslexic potential think, problem, you know, Glenn, if I may, I think, you know, the, like the, the, by the, by our book <laughs> and um, also the, um, the, the list that I provided earlier, what you want to do is you want to make your class your whole class inclusive. You just want to up your practice, level up in Japanese terms. You know what, you want to be able to reach all students no matter what. And I think this this is kind of the thing that I think we're trying to focus on here. It's not about, you know, identifying students and, and so on, I don't think. I think what we're just trying to say is if you, do some things like some of the recommendations that we've given, then you are going to reach all your students better. So there's a different, to riff on that, there's a difference between accessibility and accommodations. And if you, if you make your class more accessible, you reduce the need for making accommodations. And so I get letters, I I get (laughs) letters every semester, you know, two or three a semester from my support office at the university saying, you you have a student with blah, 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 please do this, this, and this. And I look at it and I'm able to just go, oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. I already do this as standard practice. So if, you, if you're, you know, I've already made the accommodations for a, a variety of, of forms of neurodivergence or colorblindness or what various things. 
so that if I have those students enter my classroom, I don't need to make the accommodations. My, my class has already been, has been made accessible. That's exactly. not to say I don't need to make accommodations from time to time, but that, you know, doing, shifting your practice and, and making it accessible up front is going to reduce your, your uh, burden. I don't like using that word, but it's going to reduce the extra things you need to do later on. It's also going to reduce your own cognitive load as a teacher, keeping track of all these different things. You don't need to keep track because you they're they're included, and then just again focusing on um, focusing on what you can do to to help a student do better in the class without needing a diagnosis. Because as often the case in higher education, as Mike mentioned earlier, you know students uh, in higher education they don't have to disclose; they have a right to anonymity. And so if I if I have a student who seems to be exhibiting exhibiting behaviors of X Y Z, the end of the day it doesn't matter if or what a diagnosis is. It only matters that I can address the immediate, um, you know, behavior being exhibited or the immediate concern. And that varies from student to student. And as far as, you know, if you're worried about keeping track, I mean, just uh, there's different ways to do that. I mean, one is just having your own sort of internal system. If, if, if you keep, thing in a, keep things in a spreadsheet or what have you, if that helps you. Um, a previous, and this is not possible everywhere, but at a previous place I worked, we used multidisciplinary teams. We had... Um, multi for these, these, this was for students who were disclosed, but we had unofficial ones for students who are not disclosed as well, um, which is a multidisciplinary team is basically a, a, a group of two or more people who touch base regularly to talk about a student's needs. And so if you have a student who maybe doesn't have a diagnosis, but they exhibit certain behaviors that are impacting their learning, and maybe you have a teacher down the hall, you know, you've got someone down the hall from you who has that student in another class, make a point to meet up with them for lunch on the first Friday of every month, whatever, and just touch base and talk because those conversations, they go a long way you know, just even if it's just a gripe session, I mean, it goes a long way in just helping you um, kind of process and make and make small changes and tweaks to your practice that at the end of the day are going to serve that student. And it doesn't mean that it's yeah. necessarily going to be perfect, but it, if it's better than what you did yesterday, then that's mm -hmm. that's to the student's mm -hmm. benefit and to your benefit as well. Another thing too, I'd like to add to that is uh, the last point I put on the sheet, which is to ask, uh, I had a student who would have been characterized as lazy. Um, she was falling asleep every class. And I I kept her back one day. I just said, you know, can we have a, a little chat at the end of the class? And I said, what's up? I noticed you seem to be having trouble staying awake. And she was, she pulled up her sleeve and she had the worst eczema I had ever seen. And she had it all over mm -hmm. her neck and she had mm -hmm. it all over her arms. And she said, I'm so sorry, uh, the medication that I'm taking makes me sleepy. And I was like, okay, I'm cutting you slack. You, you obviously, you have no control over this, hmm. you know? And, and so I think asking, you know, another time I had a student who would, every Friday he'd, he'd come in the class and put his head down on the desk as soon as he came in the classroom. And, uh, and I sent him an email at, um, and I said, you know, you did a writing assignment. It was really good where it's a composition class. I would like to see more of your writing, but it's tough for me because every class you come in, I see you're sleepy right away. And, and I said, you know, I, I don't mind if you bring a caffeinated drink to class. I'd like you to stay awake, do whatever. And the next week he came to class proud as punch with his can of boss. He came up to me at the front of the class. He's like, sensei, look, and I brought coffee. And then I never had that problem with him again. So, you know, um, going one-on-one -on -one to the students and finding mm -hmm. out, asking them what's going on yeah. is also very helpful, I think. Absolutely. Might I, might I also humbly suggest, I'm, I'm not uh, like the experts that are here, but um, I had a similar situation, similar reaction from certain teachers when I was talking about verbal classrooms, which Alex mentioned earlier. And um, because it's such a switch, a paradigm switch in terms of how you run the, the, the class and the targets that you have to teach, uh, a lot of people will say, yeah, but it's just so overwhelming. There's just so much to know and there's so much to learn. Uh, I would tell them in that sense, well, just do a little bit at a time. So for you, Glenn, like, yes, there are all kinds of you have to think about the dyscalculic, the dysgraphic. You have to think about uh, people with disabilities like Heather does. 
in the end, but for now, to take the first step and just start with what you can do, which is, I don't know, start by changing the fonts that you use, start by learning how to write bigger on the classroom, and then take that experience and then expand it either in the next semester or if you think, you know what, I think I've learned enough out of the book uh, to know how to deal with I don't know, dyscalculia. Okay, let me let me branch out and learn a little bit more about this. You don't have to take care of everyone all at once. It's not binary. You know, I I am I do run an accessible classroom or I don't. Do a little bit at a time, expand on it to the next step that you can, and I think uh, it'll it'll be more manageable, and you won't feel so frustrated thinking that I don't do enough. If you do a little bit at a time, I think that's fine. And there you go. Uh, we don't see any other hands up. Come on, you guys, your last chance here. You, you don't get this often. Uh, and I, but, but just because it was the point I was going to make, um, you don't get this often where like uh, these three are willing to share their time with you uh, while getting absolutely nothing in return from OTJ. I, I have no money to pay them for their time. So please take advantage of it. Buy us uh, drinks at Jolt. <laughs> There, there you go. Uh, or I, I did show, and I'll do it again here. I did show uh, the link to their book on Amazon. And uh, and I just realized uh, on the right-hand side, if you look there, you can see that I'm going to be buying some uh, micro SD cards and a magic eraser from Mr. Clean. <laughs> and, and at first I said, oh, no. But then again, you know, like, if, so now people know that I keep my, my house clean uh, with, with stuff like this. So there's nothing to be too ashamed about. Uh, okay. Hi, yeah. Oh, Alex. Uh, that just as we've been talking about, like we don't identify people. Um, I've been throwing things in the chat and into the live stream as well. Um, and one of them is a uh, one of them was the uh, yep, join the AALC. I've, <laughs> I've chat, dropped into the chat a um, a slide which is the current statistics from the um, sorry the uh, Japan. Uh, Japan uh, Student Services Organization, JASO, they provide funding. And so they do these surveys. And so out of all three point, I think it's 3.2 million students in higher education, only 1.79% of them have asked for the university for reasonable accommodations. Now, remember I said there was 8.8% of students who who appear to be in mainstream who in elementary and junior high who appear to have a learning difference who are not don't have any label don't have a, an official diagnosis or they don't have uh, they don't their parents have opted not to have them identified um so in japan only 1.79 percent of people this is from the press release it's in japanese you want to read it in english you paste it into your browser and you look for reader mode and hit the translate to English button and you'll be able to read that page in English. So that, but that 1.79% is going up. And it was interesting that of this little gray section, which is specific learning difficulties, and that section increased during COVID. And that includes people with autism, people with um, specific learning disabilities, such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, um, and, and I've got dysgraphia me. Um, and and other other unspecified or combinations of that 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 percentage of students is going up so those students are actually getting in there and asking for their support and if you if you think of how hard it is for somebody to to declare that how much fear there might be between the kids and their families about what happens if i do this what are the consequences the fact that that is being changed is going up but i can tell you that there are 13 in all of japan there are 13 students who are in who want to be teachers who have declared they have a specific learning disability that's in all of japan only 13 would be teachers who have asked for reasonable accommodations if you want to go further into it you go into the jasso site um, in the JASO site, there is a um, there's a, a more detailed. Let's drop the next level down. Um, this is the more detailed link. You can go. The second link I've just dropped in has every kind of there's um, has every kind of disability mentioned, and you can also go down and look at what happens when people apply to get in. 
So people who asked for reasonable accommodations, I think the, the ADHD group, uh, about 600 students were interested in doing an entrance test through the centre test. And of the people who, the people who actually asked for reasonable accommodations, about 40% of them got through and about 30% of them ended up enrolling. But the students who didn't declare anything, who, who, who identified as ADHD but did not ask for any support, um, their ability to get in is lower than 25% of all of those students. So we need to change the dynamic of how we're looking at things and at people. And that brings me back to the, to the, uh, the little thing I put in there, which is the header of a um a header of a a survey that that's going on. So Mark Mark Helgerson is doing a poster at Jout. We're doing it at lunchtime on the 16th in the UMI room, which is the the um uh, the EME, what's that? Um I can't remember the acronym. Sorry, Educational materials materials. Yes, that's exhibitors. it. Educational materials room. We are commandeering the poster boards to have a neurodiversity get together and information session from BrainSeq. And so um, so Mark's poster has got people who are out, who are out and happy to talk about their neurodiversity. And my poster will have um, my poster will have people who are less comfortable with being ident identified but want their voices to be heard. And I will drop a link to mm. that um, form into the chat for Speaking people who which... might like to join. Speaking of which, two things, yep. um, uh, Davey and Melody, I don't know if you've already, you, some, some of you might have already, but there's a, a comment thread uh, in OTJ as well. And some things like, I'm not sure if that 10 tips document was linked into that. Melody, I don't know if you want to uh, post it there or oh. those legal materials you want to maybe uh, make sure that they reach the widest audience. Davey, you might want to post that. Can, I, oh. can I upload documents to that? I don't know. Give it a try. Uh, and if, if you have, if you're not successful, I'll try to, to help you with that. Um, okay. Also, you have it there, I think. Yeah. I'll, I'll try a little okay, later. Just say, I, I can't do it right now. I thought maybe you might yes. be able to do it yourself. Now, okay. uh, speaking of JALT, uh, maybe not just the national conference, maybe if you have plans for PANSIG or if you have any upcoming presentations or upcoming publications, a uh, good place to like uh, give yourself a little PR here. Anything that you want to tell the audience about? Davey, Melody, Alex. Um, I will be, Alex and I are going to be part of the, uh, panel or the forum with Caitlin and Minar with our publisher, uh, and me. talking about this book and Melody as well, um, on Saturday at noon, I think. And then I, if you're there on Monday, I'm presenting some of my PhD research specifically on reflective practices, support for inclusive practices. Um, and then on December 11th, at 7 p.m., that's a Wednesday at 7 p.m. online, I'll be giving a talk for Tokyo Jolt about, um, uh, specifically I'll be talking about teacher preparedness for teaching inclusively, some hard research, um, if you're interested. And that, I don't think that the like flyer for that has gone live yet, but it should be soon. So if you keep an eye out at the Tokyo Jolt homepage or Facebook group, you should see that. But I do know it. I can tell you it's December 11th, 7 p.m. Fabulous. That's all Melody, for me. Anything, anything going on with you? Uh, uh, I'm in conference. the, yeah, I'm in the panel, uh, as Davey mentioned. And um, on Sunday, I have two around noon and one o'clock I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm going to be with the JALT publications talking about um, doing um, book reviews for JALT Journal. And I'm going to be on the Macquarie Forum uh, for talking about, um, I guess it's th those of us who've graduated from Macquarie talking about our careers post-graduation. That'd be it. And Alex? Hey, yeah, I'm just posting something in the chat. I've just posted it to our group and uh, to the, to the um, uh, where's my Zoom link gone? Zoom, where are you? Uh, okay, I'm back. Um, I've just posted that to the, the chat in the Facebook group and I have, um, I'll post it again here just in case I've, right, it's a Zoom link there. For anybody who would like to join our Google form, um, I've posted it twice. Um, and you can share that. Um, we are interested in the stories of people because they're, 
um, a lot of people, a lot of people might get into their thirties or forties or fifties or sixties, and they never knew that the reason they felt the way they did was because they are absolutely normal for who they are, but they are one of the sort of maybe anything up to 20% of people who are slightly different. But they've had this sort of sense of feeling, I am too X, Y, Z. And I went through that too. It was only when my kids got diagnosed um, that I realised that, oh, I'm in that basket as well. But having siblings who were dyslexic and me having a different kind of dyslexia, mine is called stealth dyslexia, in that I can read, but when I try to download the information, mm. I panic. And then on top of that, I have really bad handwriting. So teachers just say, oh, you don't really care, do you? You're not putting in any effort in. And that convinced me to leave education. Mm. And I, I dropped out. I wanted to play music. I couldn't get into music school because I couldn't read music. I could do the technical skills, couldn't do it. And I tell my students those experiences. I tell them, I don't care about your handwriting. Um, I do, um, if you, um, you know, when you and I type, our, hand, our typing looks the same, doesn't it? You know, we look exactly the same when we type. So I don't care. And I make that really clear to them that it's, um, uh, you know, I'm listening and I want them to know that. But there are it really is hard when people actually realise, oh, my God, there's something wrong with my kid. That's very terrifying. It takes people a few years to get used to that idea that something might be going on. And then they look at a diagnostic list for adults and they might see themselves in it. And that really um, there's possibility that people might feel angry with their parents for not having known something. But it, to be fair, their parents probably were unaware of it. It was also a social taboo. Um, and but it can be very hard if you've been in a family and you've been compared to your siblings. I know plenty of people who've been in that situation, and I just feel such a rage when I think of, you know, how hard it was for some of my brother in particular, who's an electronics and engineering genius, and he he just happened to be in a society that did not have audio, whereas another fr you know friends who had grew up in the US had access to audio. And that's the difference. That's why my brother didn't get to university. That's why I did eventually, but um, but I, but he didn't. And it just makes me so frustrated. I want something better to happen. And I know the younger adults are more likely to be open about their about being different, but it's the people who are about 40 up who are completely anxious about this, and that's why I've made my form anonymous. So, yeah, that's uh, – I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> oh, we like you on your soapbox. <laughs> Anyone else? Go ahead. Ah. I, um, one of the things I've, I've heard from more and more teachers as uh, entrance to university is changing, right? And uh, we just had a, a teacher leave my department um, at semester time to go to a different university. And I was talking to some students and one said, well, I was really glad to see him go. And I said, tell me about that. And, he, and she said, um, he always made us feel like ah, you're not actually smart enough to be in university. And I was talking to my department chair oh. after that, and I said, basically, any teacher who would say that is essentially saying, I'm a shitty teacher, because I, I don't know what to do. Bleep. Um, this is a late bleep for you. <laughs> well, yeah. No, no, my, leave that That's in. okay. Don't bleep it up. No, my no, 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 chair, no. My department chair totally got it and agreed with me but it because th that teacher was not there anymore so i could say that publicly and i thought it was useful to say it publicly because i've heard this a few times from a few different people but i think helping create that it's like we are responsible for the students in front of us whether they happen to be easy to teach or not and looking at ways to reach them, help them. 
Anyway, yes. end of the Yep. Well, I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to get on their soapbox, but we love it when you do. And that's well, why Adam, we did Adam's this this been afternoon. Soapboxing from the from the Facebook live stream. Adam yeah, Jenkins has been They're, soapboxing. Um, I, Six, seven, I don't think he's years. here at the moment, but I don't think it, don't don't know whether he's lurking around or not. But Adam has been saying, uh, yeah, he, Adam has very strong views mm. about yeah, it being the the responsibility of the teacher to improve the environment, yeah, and to give people options. To give, he's actually designed this sort of like it's like plan your own adventure course for yeah. his for his for his um, units that students like they can choose which of the elements that give them the same content, which way they want to do the on the, the content is of make your own adventure studying. And he's made it fun. Like he's gamified things. He's given them so many different options. And I absolutely love that. And I'm now trying that out in my classes. And I'm, uh, I'm also picking up parts of it. You can do as uh, um, like automatic, automatically graded content checks, <laughs> automatically graded activities. Yes. That means I'm now free to do more in, you know, more, put more time into mm. um, adjusting things mm. to make my, to make my information better, to make my information more, more useful. So um, Adam has also created a, um, he's created a, uh, a plugin for the Moodle system, uh, which is allows people to uh, customize their screen. They can have their screen their way in the entire color spectrum for the background and for the font. You are not limited to a few colors. You can have any color in the spectrum. And I will chuck a link of that into the chat. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm... No, I keep burning out on this. I'm, I'm actually having dyslexic burnout. Dyslexic burnout, <laughs> or so it's an ADD burnout. When you're dealing with reading activities like things that involve reading and if i'm doing that while i'm listening and reading and there was some study um people in australia found out in about 1999 they did mri uh functional mri research and they noticed that the on well, this bunch of boys and the boys who had dyslexia used 4.5 times more lactate they had a difference of lactate uh, I think I can't remember the word now. I'm going going COVID brain. Um, the the lactose activity in their brain had uh, 4.5 times the amount of energy used to process language activities than the non dyslexics. Mm -hmm. And when your brain becomes tired, you need to invoke a Mark Helgeson brain break and get people to stand up and do something to bring up your blood oxygen to the brain. But this is why these students will crash and burn, why they will be face down and why they will zone out if they have too much text heavy material at them and then you keep talking at them. Um, they're just like, it's too much. So you have to sort of, as a teacher, you not only have to plan what you're doing, you have to create a wave in your teaching process to allow students thinking and processing time. So, yeah, that's um, another soapbox element. And Brent Simmons uh, uses the sit in the chair mode. Go and sit in the students' chairs. I sort of, um, and he pushes that line. I, 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 made a vice, I made a principal go and sit in the students' chairs one afternoon, and he was shocked by how the blackboard looked from different positions in the classroom, depending on the light. And so Brent picked that up and ran with it, and he's doing that as well. Um, you know, sit in their chair look at the screen, go back to the back of the room where the kids are that are hiding from trying to stay out of sight and see what it looks like from there. Look from the worst possible seat in the classroom at your teaching environment and then change it from there. Mm -hmm. Chair challenge. That's an easy one to implement, by the way, Glenn. Yeah. Very, very easy one. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I want to say I had fun. I haven't done this in a little while, but I thought this was a really worthwhile thing to do. Please go and see uh, the panel at uh, Jalton National for the, the publisher Candlin and Minard's um, 
thing that they're having and whatever poster presentations, because every time I talk to Alex, every time I talk to um, Adam, uh, and now it, obviously uh, every time I'm sure that I would ever have a chance in the future to talk to Davey and uh, I love talking to Melody anytime I learn more stuff. So it's always good to learn more stuff because we're teachers. Thank you everyone for coming. I am now going to say goodbye. I hope you all do too. And I'm going to end the live video. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Thank you everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thank Bye -bye. you.